Welcome to the Test Guild Automation Podcast, where we all get together to learn more about automation and software testing with your host, Joe Calantonio. Hey, it's Joe and welcome to another episode of the Test Guild Automation Podcast. Today we'll be talking with Ramona all about avoiding common testing pitfalls. Really excited about this talk. I saw her give a, a similar kind of session at Future of Testing this year uh, around these type of topics. Really cool slide deck as well. So I'll have a link to that after the show is over. But if you don't know her, uh, Ramona, uh, her apprenticeship started as an application developer and Ramona contributed to product development at Shopware AG for more than five years now, first in quality assurance and now as a developer core. She has both views of the product, which is rare. So she's both a developer and tester. So we get to see how a developer really thinks about testing. And so uh, really excited about that. And Ramona uses the um, uses this primarily as a strength, obviously, to trust in test automation and knows how to you know, create tests to help support the testers as well. And the automation in the end-to-end -end area of shopware originates from her pen and she continues to push it firmly. Really excited to have her on the show today. You don't want to miss this episode. Check it out. The Test Guild Automation Podcast is sponsored by the fantastic folks at Sauce Labs. Their cloud-based test platform helps ensure your favorite mobile apps and websites work flawlessly on every browser, operating system, and device. Get a free trial. Visit testguild.com forward slash sauce labs and click on the exclusive sponsor section to try it for free for 14 days. Check it out. Hey, Ramona. Welcome to the Guild. Hello. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> Awesome, awesome to have you. Uh, Ramona, before we get into it, is there anything I missed in your bio that you want the guild to know more about? Well, I guess you summed it up quite well. Um, I see myself as a tester and a developer alike, so I hope I can yeah, share experience from both worlds and to get both roles together a bit more, especially when it comes to testing. Awesome. Now, why, why do you feel that way? Do you feel like most developers you speak to don't have it both together? Or is it just because you have a unique take because you've done both both sides of the uh, the aisle? Well, it originates a bit from my beginning where developers and testers, at least it was my impression that they just worked a bit against each other, not sharing the same mindset or working as a team and yeah, kind of understanding each other and feeling more love than hate. So um, it was a huge motivation for me to get them together and you know, get them to like each other. At least in my team, I think I was quite um, successful and I hope to share it with you all if you need it. And yeah, because we both, uh, we developers and the testers, we both want the same things, having a wonderful experience for the customer and for the users. So. I think we should keep that in mind sometimes. Well, now that you mentioned it, then how, how did you do that? How did you, uh, or how do you help uh, tell people any tips on how they can help their teams maybe to embrace testing beyond just testers? Well, we consider testing like a coaching role. So if the developer was um, finishing his implementation or her implementation, um, they got together with a tester, talked about the new feature, the task or whatever they did and thought about the thing they might have forgotten to test. So the developer learned to test better and the tester learned to understand the developer's point of view. So they yeah, started to share the same perspective and I quite love to see that. And so I'm just wondering if your this presentation came out of that experience because I think maybe I'm wrong. T developers maybe aren't very familiar with testing, so maybe they have certain practices that make testing painful. So therefore, they associate bad practices with testing, and therefore testing is bad rather than maybe changing an approach to make uh, testing more uh, uh, more of like a, a safety net for them before they release code. Well, I think yeah, both things. Um... With this impression and especially my way to um, become a developer and getting to know especially unit testing and the mindset behind of it. Um, if you wait tested, uh, tests as a tester or in quality assurance, you have more 
a user focused um, perspective if you here yeah. I love to use the work workflow based for um, end to end testing because you try to write them for the user and the user's behavior and um, if you are writing unit tests you might have another mindset and um, it was quite interesting for me to see the difference but also the um, yeah the things which are basically equally for both very cool and so ever since your uh, your presentation I can't get your impression of Admiral Akbar out of my brain <laughs> yeah. um, and the reason why is uh, I guess you have a concept in testing called it's a trap um, and that's I guess you, you we build off this so what, what did you mean by it's a trap when you gave that that particular uh, that session I saw myself sometimes um, going the simple way to use more convenient or easy um, ways to write my test, thinking, oh, that will be fine, it's short, it's not exhausting. And I thought I would be good doing that, but sometimes those easy ways um, became like kryptonite for me because they had consequences, let's put it that way. Um, may it be um, low performance in my test, flakiness, which is my, I hope it's the good uh, expression for it, final boss um, to conquer. And yeah, sometimes I was a bit, yeah, the past Ramona was sometimes a fool <laughs> to believe um, the easy way would be the best one. And I'm sure it's not just you. Uh, uh, that's probably everyone thinks it's it's going to be easy for testing, and all of a sudden, uh, over a few sprints, you're like, "Oh my gosh, what have I done?" So I think there are three main points or three pain points you've mentioned that maybe cause that situation as well. Um, can you talk about the three pain points? I don't know if you remember what they are, but uh, there are a few pain points that you that you associated with uh, this kind of trap. Oh yeah, um, the first one being slow tests, or at least the slow execution time of those tests. Um, Sometimes uh, teammates came to me and were really annoyed by the waiting times they got when they want their pull request to be merged or something. And I can totally understand that, um, especially when you're working in the e-commerce sector as I do and your um, software you're working with on a daily basis grows bigger and more complex. You have a certain amount of tests and a certain test coverage. and this can be um yeah many tests need many time to be executed and so you really need to keep an eye on it being the least painful um yeah this was quite bad especially when you are writing tests in a not that effective way or not that efficient um another one which I stumbled upon lots of times where tests that are difficult to maintain. Imagine this case, um, you're looking at your old test you wrote maybe one year ago or something like that and you have no clue what you mean by that, what you wanted to achieve with that test or where do you wrote it in the first place. And yeah, I don't think that a test you don't understand gives you any value, so that's kind of problematic. And yeah, the third one, which I call the final boss, is flakiness. <laughs> These are tests who are um, sometimes passing, sometimes failing, without you changing anything in between, and yeah, giving you no consistent value or result at all, giving you yeah, no clue if your test is actually good or not. And yeah, this is a point I spent hours debugging, and yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare for me. Absolutely. And I think it trips everyone up for sure. Uh, what I think it's interesting is I started years ago, 20 years ago, using a tool called WinRunner. And these same type of pain points were there with WinRunner, but people always think the next, it's always the tool's problem. Like back then it was WinRunner, then QTP, and now it's Selenium is causing these and then other tools. So do, do these apply to, to any type of testing? Like I know you use Jest and Cypress. Do, uh, are these type of pain points of uh, do you see existing in all, in all types of, of, of automation or all type of testing? Well, um, if you are asking the question on if 
I encountered when I have to admit yes. Even with just in Cyprus, I tend to stumble upon flakiness as well, but not that often as I um, experience at the Selenium or Nightwatch or any web driver based um, framework. So they might come up with any testing framework, especially if you think about being um, product sided courses like race condition or another bug which is happening um, sporadically and in this case you really need to take them seriously because think about every um, one of five builds may be failing how many users will encounter the bug so it don't need to be the test itself absolutely and i, I assume when, when when you're talking about your, your approach to testing does it apply to both unit testing and functional automation testing? Uh, when people hear developer, they just tune out and probably think uh, they only do unit testing and may not realize you do all end-to-end -end testing. Well, um, do you refer to the testing traps or the flakiness or the pain points we talked about? I'd say the trap in general. Ah, okay. Um, I think it's alike. Um, you can meet some traps in unit testing or integration testing. And of course, in NGN testing, I think it's more common in NGN testing, but that may be biased by my experience. Um, I assume it's because you need the whole tech stack to be available in an NGN test. But I, uh, I counted some traps specifically tailored to unit testing, so um, it might happen. Cool. So I'd probably like to dive into the three pain points and then how you kind of solve them or how you found kind of workarounds to make it better with the pain points. The first one was the golden rule for testing. What yeah. is the golden rule for testing? Well, that was uh, a pro an approach um, I met when writing the JavaScript testing best practices by Unicode, and I highly recommend you to read this. I think it's a GitHub repo or something like that. Um, it's a wonderful, yeah approach to any JavaScript based testing, no matter the type. And um, I think the golden rule is that you should be able to get the intent of the test instantly when you look at it. At first sight, at first impression, it should be so easy to read that you actually don't need to think about it. Um, your test shouldn't be um, eating up some your headspace any um exhausting thoughts anything when you work you have enough things to think about when working with production to code so tests shouldn't be a problem in this case it's like a routine in the best case that's a good point some people may think it's trivial uh, i forgot who told me this they said that most of their time is spent reading code than actually writing it so if you can't read it, it's going to be a nightmare to debug. Even if you create the code yourself six months later, you're looking at yeah. it like, what was I talking about here, right? So oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point. So I, I, I think another thing you brought up, which is interesting is um, you said something, I think it was automation code is, is not production code. I think people may get this mixed up. A lot of mm -hmm. times people say automation is is software development, but then when you say it's not production code, they might think, well, you're minimizing it. So what would you mean by automation code is not production code? Yeah, that's a wonderful point because um, sometimes in my talks, I like to seed up some things to discuss about. So I really love to be on on-site conferences later on some hot run. Hopefully, when COVID-19 isn't that much of an issue, maybe, hopefully, you know what I mean. So this um, kind of um, sentence are perfect to discuss with the participants. Um, I had a wonderful discussion about that later after the conference in uh, Twitter as well, because, well, I was a bit um, straight when I told it's not production code. Let me rephrase that. You, Of course, you should treat testing code like production code with the same value. You shouldn't say, oh, it's just testing code. We don't need to have a look at it. Actually, this is a trap we went into when it comes to code reviews by our in our company. And sometimes I read some tests at our repository of GitHub and I think, oh my God, <laughs> who wanna prove that? Because uh, they didn't think of uh, test code being so important than production code. So don't get me wrong in this point. It's 
equally important at least but um, there are some patterns some conventions which are important for production code but not that suitable to test code um, my favorite example is the principle don't repeat yourself but dry principle which basically tells you you should uh, should avoid the application at all costs but if you do that in tests and you make it more difficult to read and understand the test at first sight because you lose lots of abstraction, for example, or less documentation or comments. Um, you make it more difficult to understand the test in, yeah, in the future or to maintain it. So this pattern might be conflicting to the golden rule and thus you should, um, yeah, rethink it and maybe use some documentation or some duplication and say oh it's okay if i can get the intent of the test better this way no 100 percent. I, I love this point uh, because uh sometimes we make things over complicated thinking that it, like you said we're not you're not minimizing automation code you should be following best practices and such but there's certain production code practices that don't come into play or shouldn't come into play with test code doesn't mean it's less than. Anyway, um, I just want to make that clear so I don't get any hate, hate email on my end either. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> you also made a good point of uh, test only as much as you need. So I think uh, sometimes people go to one extreme or the other. Either they don't do any testing or they go full blown. I'm going to have 100% coverage and it's a nightmare. So where's that sweet spot? What, what are your thoughts on test only as much as you need? Actually, I did a workshop of this topic with some testers today where we thought about, okay, especially when it comes to the end-to-end -end testing area, what should be tested as an end-to-end -end test, which is better um, written as a unit test, or what should you yeah, not test at all, especially people with um, quality assurance background tend to test too much. So your test runtime gets horrible and yeah, you're wasting resources for some details you don't need to know and you wouldn't test manually at all. So um, my sweet spot would be uh, two aspects. Consider how um, likely it is for a user to encounter an error. So see the happy path, the CRUD operations of a feature, all the things users tend to use a lot. There, an error would be quite obvious and quite, yeah, annoying. Um, the other aspects, um, I love to use the word critical path in there. Um, it's a workflow, it's a path where you can't afford any damage where damage would be quite expensive or have high risk for the user. In e-commerce sector, I always think about registration, login, or the checkout. If it's, it broke, it's, it was broken in a release, um, our customer would lose lots of money. So having it tested in more detail is quite important. No, absolutely. I see a lot of people don't realize risk is a really good, uh, I guess, indicator of where to focus most of your time in it, for sure. I think you also mentioned once people know where to focus their time in, once once they know the risk and where where, where what they should test, um, I think you have a framework almost that test should contain three different things. Can, can you explain a little bit what, how, how you see testing, what those three things are that you think a test should have? Um, do you refer to unit testing or to testing um, in general. So I think you, you said something about uh, what is being tested, what scenarios should be tested, and what is the expected result what were the three things I had listed. I think. Yeah, um, this is a pattern I um, saw in the internet at first. Um, it's the uh, AAA pattern, but it's more suitable to um, unit testing because they tend to be more short. Um, of course, I will get to these three aspects, but um, it's more difficult for a longer or taller um, end to end test to see all the three uh, things clearly um, structured. But um, if you read through an end to end test, you find those three aspects as well. It's about range, um, act, and assert. Range should be 
when you think about an NGN test, the first part of your test. And in it, you define anything you need to um, start your scenario. For example, declaring variables or you're doing anything before a test. The second one being the, act, the action where you do the um, steps of your test, anything you need to do to test your scenario. And the second and quite safe explanatory one is assert. You assert on the status of the thing you test to yeah, get some information of the status of the things you test and to see if anything's okay or anything breaks. Um, it's an interesting point because I had a discussion with my um, colleague shortly after the talk um, when it comes to the unit or component tests we sh um, write at our daily business. This AAA pattern cannot be um, used 100% because sometimes we need to assert the state before we act, before we test. So. Um, we had a quite exciting discussion about that and came to the um, to another pattern called um, given when then pattern. It's a bit um, refers to BDD, uh, the behavior driven development, where you define at first what is given, so you can do those assertions before a test because it um, can be counted to this given um, area. Then the when area, where you say what you expect when something happens. And then would be your assertion. So it's a bit another approach, but um, aiming to, this, um, to the same result, basically, to have a clean test structure and to make it easier to understand your test at first sight. Nice. So once you have like a uh, the pattern in place, you have what you think is a clean test. Um, I think another thing people get tripped up on is test data, and that's a tough. A lot of people really find this as an issue. Oh, Any yeah. tips around test data? How to how to work with that when you're running tests in parallel, especially? Um, well, um, a little disclaimer first. Um, I came to one approach. I um, I can accept, I'm quite satisfied with it, but it's not perfect. And if you got any advices, especially when it comes to end testing, um, please contact me on Twitter or wherever, because it's a topic I will, yeah, I think I won't stop thinking about in the near future. Um, you need to con uh, you need to take in mind that if you use maybe two tests, like test A and test B, and they are referred to the same test data, that can be quite problematic, especially leading to flaky tests if you screw it up a lot. Um, because if the first test um, changes something inside of this data and the second one um, has a dependency on this data, may it be by um, purpose or accidentally, the last test, test B, will fail and you need to... yeah take a lot of time to debug that because if you see some test results, you think the error is in the test, not in the data. Um, a little um, real life example. Um, sometimes in my yeah, starting time, I used a, a MySQL dump test data for all of my tests. And some somehow some side effect came into place where the first or second test altered the data and all of those test following failed and you really don't want to have that so um, this is an example from end-to-end -end testing but um, it could be important for unit testing as well if you um, you take the same C data or something so um, a solution would be trying to keep your test as isolated as possible um, I use an end-to-end -end example because I'm most familiar with it but if I write a test, I uh, take care that I'm always starting with the same basis, a clean installation of my software or whatever, and I take care um, of the test data for every test specifically and isolate it. Um, that means in my example, I use API requests to um, create all the data I need, and afterwards I start to do my assertions or anything I want to test. So I don't, I know because of the cleanup, there won't be any side effects from old data or whatever. 
and I will ha always have the data I need to um, run my test smoothly. And this way I avoided lots of flakiness, actually. Now, that's a great tip. I, I know when I worked for an enterprise company, we had a data loader which would insert data beforehand with an API and then clean it up at the end, and we, we found it pretty reliable. As long as we didn't create corruption in the database because some people weren't using all their fields needed for the statement. But anyway, um, you also touched on two other things I think a lot of people, a lot of times make test unstable. Uh, the first one was um, the locator strategy. So do you have any tips for locator strategies when dealing with, uh, I guess, end-to-end -end testing mostly? Yeah, that's an uh, approach to uh, avoid testing implementation details because mm. with most tests you want to ensure that the user has a wonderful experience with their software and won't encounter any bugs. So you need to um, think the test of, yeah, like an image of your user. And if you are testing implementation details, for example, um, basing uh, um, writing your test based on CSS selectors, which might change in the future, um, you can get into a quite annoying situation. Imagine you refactored your application, did some more styling, anything like that, and your test fails because of it. Your test is just outdated and there's no bug inside of your application. So your test will signalize there's an error if there is no error at all. And um, so in this case, you won't be able to see the problem of a failing test at first sight, making it harder and more annoying to maintain. Um, the solution would be um, searching for selectors, which are less prone to change. Um, my favorite ones are data attributes with a nice um, yeah, naming like, let's take data Cypress test or something which is quite obvious for the developer if he reads it. So he knows, oh, this is a data attribute which is used for testing. I won't change it. And he can continue with his refactoring without any further notice and without breaking any of your tests. Absolutely. It's a great strategy. I guess another thing though is um, sometimes people do an assertion on a locator uh, for an element after they do a, a, an action and they don't wait enough or they have weird, they, they sum them off with their waiting strategy. Any yeah. tips around that as well? <laughs> I think my uh, friends or colleagues will say, oh, you're so annoying in this point because <laughs> I never stop um, telling it to people and you're yeah, getting on their nerves because if someone thinks it's a good idea to use fixed waiting times in their test and I happen to be the reviewer of it, I won't approve at all because um, think about the best case if you wait, um, let's say, one second every time you do whatever you want to do in your test, clicking something or whatever, and your application is already um, there to be interacted with um, in a half a second or something, you wait too long, which makes your test inefficiently and basically too slow. Um, but that's not the worst case. Worst case being you wait, you don't wait enough time. Um, imagine your application is under load and you wait too less time, your test will fail in this occasion if there's load. So again, there will be flakiness and it's quite painful to debug that. So Ramon, I don't, I'm not sure if you coined this term or if it's some, some, someone else's uh, flat test design I have in my notes. What is flat test design? Yeah, it, it sounds uh, more difficult than it actually is. Um, try to keep your test simple. Don't use too much abstraction. I love to use the word minimalistic for it. As um, simple as possible and as pleasant to read as possible. Um, less abstraction, of course, if the application gets out of control. Of course, you can use your custom commands if you um, take some attention on the naming of the commands and maybe uh, some TypeScript definitions or any other uh, yeah, possibility to um, strengthen developer experience here. But, um, well, don't test too much even inside of your test um, just to keep the memory okay and um, here, keep it 
clean and minimalistic. So it's not that that difficult to read on to understand your test later on or if someone other some other um, developer wants to work with it. Awesome. Okay, Ramona, before we go, is there one piece of actual advice you can give to someone to help them with their automation testing efforts? You've given a bunch, but just don't know if there's one that you always go to and what's the best way to find or contact you? Um, there's one thought I want to remember you. Um, if there's one sentence you need to take away as a learning from this um, podcast um, episode, think about your test like a friendly assistant not a hindrance or something you don't want to work with. It should yeah, make your life easier, not bad. So um, yeah, this is the most important thing to remember. I think it's yeah, it's in Uni Goldberg's guide as well. So it's actually quite important. And I think it sums up everything in a neat little way. Um, if you want to contact me, I think the best way is using Twitter or LinkedIn actually. Um, my handle is leichteckig which is, I think, I hope it's good to keep in mind if you're not German, <laughs> but I think it's okay. So you should be able to find me with this handle. Awesome. I'll have a link to all that in the show notes as well. So people will be able to find you right away. Awesome stuff. Thanks again for your automation awesomeness. The links to everything of value we covered in this episode, head on over to testguild.com forward slash A. Three five nine, And while you're there, make sure to click on the Try for Free Today link under the exclusive sponsor section to learn all about Sauce Lab's awesome products and services. And if the show has helped you in any way, why not rate it and review it in iTunes? Reviews really help in the rankings of the show, and I read each and every one of them. So that's it for this episode of the Test Guild Automation Podcast. I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed with creating end-to-end -end full stack automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Guild Automation Podcast. Head on over to testguild.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and online testing conferences. Don't forget to subscribe to the Guild to continue your testing journey.